2007 was a huge year in pop culture. In the world of television, we would see not only the end of The Sopranos, but also the beginning of Mad Men. In film, we'd see Mickey Rourke take on the starring role in The Wrestler. And meanwhile, in the WWE, we'd have one of the most memorable years in company history. However, not all for good reason. But how did it all happen? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into the entire story from start to finish in WWE in 2007, A Year in Review. When we last left off, Batista was standing tall once more as SmackDown's top dog, ECW was dying fast, and John Cena was riding high as WWE Champion, even if he was facing a growing wave of fan backlash. But fans were the least of his worries heading into the first pay-per-view of the year, New Year's Revolution, on January 7th, because there, he'd have to contend with the man who'd spent the last few months of 2006 making his life a living hell, and that was Umaga. Before their bout took place, though, Jeff Hardy and Johnny Nitro would settle their ongoing beef over the Intercontinental title inside of a steel cage, Mickey James would take her spot as the reigning queen of the women's division when she beat Victoria, and Rated RKO and DX would go to a no contest in a brutal battle over the world tag team belts. Then, once all that was done, the final Raw exclusive pay-per-view of the era would see Big Match John finally prove some of his doubters wrong when he had a pretty great match with Umaga, which eventually saw him come out the victor. Not that this would be the end of the feud, however, because with the Samoan still feeling like he could dethrone the champ if he had one more shot, a rematch would be booked for the Royal Rumble later that month on January 28th. Of course, that wouldn't be the only world title program on this show, however, because on the SmackDown side of things, the meteoric rise of Mr. Kennedy would continue with him finally getting a shot at Batista. That said, despite the heel's best efforts here, it would be the champ who came out the victor, and the same could be said for the Cena-Umaga rematch too as it happened. But at least Umaga now had the feather in the cap of being able to say that, during his last man standing bout with Big Match John, he'd helped him put on probably his best singles bout to date, as over the course of a bloody and brutal 23 minutes, they'd pretty much steal the show. And this is even more impressive because they had such strong competition that night. Competition which included the Hardys and Eminem going at it in a tag team match, Bobby Lashley successfully defending his ECW world title against Test, and the Royal Rumble itself where, for the first time ever, the number 30 entrant would get the win when The Undertaker got the luck of the draw and used it to his advantage. Of course, he almost wasn't able to do so though, because the last few minutes of this one would see the dead man have to contend with Shawn Michaels, as the two had a bit of a mini-match which marked their first on-screen interaction since 1998. And the fact that HBK would end up getting eliminated by his old rival here stung all the more, because in the weeks prior, his tag partner Triple H had been taken out with a quad tear, meaning he was going to miss the next seven months of action. So with the plan originally having been for him to have a rematch from the year prior with John Cena at WrestleMania 23, it meant that things would have to be rewritten at the last minute. That said, the company still had some time to figure out what they were going to do, because before the showcase of The Immortals, the final SmackDown exclusive show of the era would come on February 18th when No Way Out was held. And here, the rise of Mr. Kennedy would continue when he was able to score a DQ victory over reigning ECW champion Bobby Lashley. But that wasn't all that was going on during this one though, because elsewhere on the card, Chavo Guerrero would regain the Cruiserweight title during a Cruiserweight Open match, Paul London and Brian Kendrick would successfully defend the WWE Tag Team titles against Deuce and Domino, and the two WrestleMania World title programs would be set up when Batista and The Undertaker teamed up to take on John Cena and Shawn Michaels. Yes, in the wake of the Phenom choosing to go after the World Heavyweight title at the big show, HBK had been selected as the man to replace the game on the Raw side. And what a choice this turned out to be, because the match he went on to have with Cena at Mania would prove to be another career best for the champ. Before we'd get there though, the WWE Hall of Fame would take place on March 31st and would see another all-star class be inducted. Then, once that was done, the following night, WrestleMania 23 would take place in front of a sold-out Detroit crowd. 
And aside from the two big-time main events, what made this one even more notable was the fact that, in the now infamous Battle of the Billionaires, with Steve Austin acting as the special guest referee, Vince McMahon and Donald Trump would both choose surrogates to take on each other, with these surrogates ending up being Umaga on the McMahon side and Bobby Lashley on the Trump side. And not only did this mark a huge career highlight for both wrestlers then, it also helped to push the show over the top financially and make it the highest grossing pay-per-view WWE had ever done at the time. But it wasn't only the Battle of the Billionaires which made this one so memorable. No, elsewhere the rest of the card was stacked out with great bout after great bout, bouts which included the likes of the Money in the Bank ladder match where Mr. Kennedy would win the whole thing so as to earn himself a world title shot at a time of his choosing. So needless to say then, he was watching both main events carefully, as in the first one, The Undertaker's run of classic streak matches would begin when he had put on a 5-star showing with Batista and took things to 15-0 in the process. Then after that, John Cena and Shawn Michaels would have arguably an even better contest when over the course of almost 30 minutes, HBK did everything he could to make Big Match John look like a killer. But no matter how hard he tried, Michaels just couldn't manage to get the adult male fans behind the reigning champion. So hoping another round might solve the problem then, he'd take on Cena in a rematch on the April 23rd episode of Raw, with this one going for a full hour and still standing today as one of the greatest bouts WWE has ever given away on free TV. That said, for a certain section of the audience, John's performance on that night still wasn't enough and neither was his impressive showing at Judgment Day the following Sunday, where he once again successfully defended his title, this time against HBK, Edge, and Randy Orton in a fatal four-way match. But it wasn't just the Raw main event scene which was being represented on this show, because with WWE deciding to scrap the idea of doing brand-specific pay-per-views following WrestleMania, fans would also get to see Batista and The Undertaker have their much-anticipated rematch here, too. Of course, unlike Mania where the dead man had picked up the clean win, this time things would end far less definitively as after both men failed to answer a 10 count, the bout was thrown out and declared a draw. But as disappointing as this was for the audience in attendance, at least they'd gotten to see a world title change earlier on in the evening, because after being forced to defend his ECW title in a 3-on-1 handicap match against Umaga, Vince McMahon, and Shane McMahon, the Almighty would end up getting pinned by none other than the boss himself. Yes, if the once extreme Philly promotion wasn't already dead and buried before this, the sight of Vince McMahon coming out to the ring the next week with a do-rag on his head and the ECW belt around his waist just about made fans who remembered what the promotion had once been vomit in their mouths. And sure, it would lead to Lashley getting a rematch at the next pay-per-view of the year, Judgment Day, but by then, the damage had already been done. Before we'd even get to Judgment Day, however, the company would find themselves having to deal with even more bad news when Mr. Kennedy suffered what was, at the time, believed to be a pretty serious tricep injury. Plans had to be changed at the last minute, and Kennedy would instead drop the briefcase to Edge during an impromptu match on the May 7th episode of Raw. And now holding the same prize he had the year before then, the ultimate opportunist would make it a double when just four days later on SmackDown, he'd cash in on The Undertaker after the champ had just survived a grueling steel cage bout with Batista, with Edge using the dead man's weakened state here to make short work of him and become the World Heavyweight Champion once again. Of course, this would then lead us directly into Judgment Day on May 20th, where in his first big title defense, the Rated R Superstar would go to war with Batista. Elsewhere, meanwhile, Randy Orton would defeat Shawn Michaels by means of technical knockout after giving him a kayfabe concussion. CM Punk would get his first big singles win on pay-per-view when he made short work of Elijah Burke. John Cena would be forced to try and get a good showing out of the great Kali. And Bobby Lashley would fail to win back the ECW world title despite pinning Shane McMahon in another three-on-one handicap match. Why had he not won the belt here? Well, he hadn't pinned the champion. So in order to settle things once and for all then, a final one-on-one -on -one meeting between the boss and the Almighty would be booked for June 3rd's One Night Stand, where after just over 12 minutes, Lashley got the win and his title back. That said, even if this bout was a focused upon one, by now One Night Stand was less of an ECW exclusive show and more of a regular WWE branded one. 
And so, that was why the rest of the card would be largely filled out with Raw and SmackDown matches, the most notable of which saw the Hardys defeat the world's greatest tag team for the world tag team titles, and Edge retain the world heavyweight title in a steel cage bout against Batista. So after not only the failure of the show, but also his inability to keep the ECW title around his waist, on the June 11th episode of Raw, a new storyline began which saw Vince McMahon's limo explode with him inside it, with this supposedly killing him off for good as an on-screen character. As we all know now though, this whole angle, and the murder mystery which followed, would soon have to be scrapped abruptly. Before we get to the reasons behind this, however, June 24th would see Vengeance Night of Champions take place, where, in a pretty meh B-show, Edge would once again successfully defend his World Heavyweight title against Batista, and John Cena would manage to stand tall despite going up against four opponents in the form of Bobby Lashley, King Booker, Randy Orton, and Mick Foley. Of course, this was also the night that the CM Punk Chris Benoit showdown over the vacant ECW title was planned to go ahead. However, Benoit would no-show the event, leading to Johnny Nitro having to sub in for him at the last minute and win the belt in his place. And while at the time people within WWE were concerned about why the usually punctual Benoit would miss the show, it was hoped there was a reasonable explanation to the entire thing. Tragically, however, the very next day, the bodies of not only Benoit, but of his wife Nancy and son Daniel too would be discovered dead at their home in Fayetteville, Georgia. Yes. We had to get here eventually, so let's get it over and done with. Over the weekend prior, Benoit had killed both Nancy and Daniel, all before then taking his own life too. And following this then, for WWE, the subsequent fallout would be nuclear. That's right, every media source in the world were now following the story. Hell, so bad would it get that at moments, it felt like this could be the thing which sunk the entire industry, as it was the worst case of negative public perception pro wrestling had gone through. So needing to clean up their act then, WWE would immediately ban the use of chair shots to the head, all while implementing a new concussion policy and beginning the process of moving their program in a more PG direction. On top of that, as a result of what had happened, the planned Vince McMahon funeral, which was supposed to air on the following episode of Raw, would be scrapped, as instead, Vince appeared live in the ring and addressed the whole issue, with this being the last time Benoit's name would ever be uttered on WWE TV. So following this then, Vince did what he always did and pushed on with the show, as on June 22nd, the Great American Bash would take place. And while not a particularly memorable show, this one would at least give us the bizarre pair-ups of Randy Orton vs. Dusty Rhodes and Carlito vs. The Sandman. Then after that, John Cena would rack up yet another successful title defense when he got the better of Bobby Lashley, all before the great Khali's first world heavyweight title defense took place against Batista and Kane. Yes, lost in all this madness was the fact that after Edge had fallen to a pectoral injury and been forced to vacate the top prize on SmackDown, Kali would win a battle royal on the July 20th episode of the show to start his first reign on top. That said, his ability to get over with fans outside of his native India meant that this run would be nearing its end by the time the summer came to a close, as at August 26th SummerSlam, he'd fall to Batista by disqualification. Elsewhere on the show, meanwhile, both the WWE title and the ECW title would stay around the waists of John Cena and John Morrison in more definitive fashion when they got the better of their opponents, Randy Orton and CM Punk, respectively. But aside from the in-ring return of Triple H, too, when he took on and defeated King Booker, these would really mark the only notable moments of what was, by the company's usual standards, a pretty weak SummerSlam overall. And things wouldn't be much better on the weekly shows either then, as on the September 10th episode of Raw, one of the sillier angles in recent memory would take place when it was revealed that the secret illegitimate son of Vince McMahon was none other than Hornswoggle. Of course, it wasn't always meant to be this way, you know, it was meant to be Mr. Kennedy who filled the role here, but with him returning to action only to then get suspended after failing a drug test, plans would have to be changed and his push would be killed stone dead as a result. Still, there was always the hope that the next pay-per-view would see an upswing for WWE, as on September 16th, they'd put on Unforgiven. Unfortunately though, this would also end up being a fairly limp effort, as aside from Batista finally dethroning the great Kali and Randy Orton getting a DQ win over John Cena, nothing much of note would happen. 
Of course, it wasn't as if there was nothing worth watching in the company at all at this point because only a few weeks prior, CM Punk had finally climbed the next rung on the ladder to success when he defeated John Morrison to become ECW World Champion. But even this would come with a price because while a new champion was being crowned over on the Extreme brand, yet another had to vacate as a result of injury when John Cena tore his pectoral muscle and was forced to relinquish the belt he'd by that point held on to for 380 days. So, needing to announce a new champ quickly then, Vince McMahon would come down to the ring at the beginning of October 7th's No Mercy and award the strap to the number one contender, Randy Orton. That said, one person who took umbrage with this was Triple H, as feeling like he deserved to be the champion instead, he'd immediately challenge the Viper to a match. And in a shock to everyone, he'd actually go on to win this one and start his own sixth reign with that particular belt. But even this wouldn't be the end of the night for the WWE title yet, because after being forced to then defend against Umaga later that evening, the game would survive just enough to then have his bones picked by Randy Orton once more. Yes, in what turned out to be the third WWE title match on the show, Orton and Triple H would go once again here, and with the game being so beaten down by this point, there was no chance he was going to be able to overcome the odds anymore. But at least the other world champions were able to retain their gold at this show because, in the undercard prior to this, CM Punk would continue his rise with a win over The Miz, and Batista would overcome the Great Khali inside of the dreaded Punjabi prison. Of course, the reason that the animal and the best in the world had been able to do so was because they had the necessary preparation time for their big bouts. When it came to the next pay-per-view of the year, however, Cyber Sunday on October 28th, they would not have such a luxury, as just like in years prior, the matches here would be voted on by fans. And that led to some interesting bouts on the undercard then, such as Punk defending his world title against The Miz, Triple H and Umaga going at it again in a street fight, and Shawn Michaels getting a shot at revenge against Randy Orton, with the WWE title this time being on the line. Then, as if those weren't big-time enough contests, the main event would see Batista and The Undertaker continue their series, with the added caveat on that night being that Stone Cold Steve Austin would serve as the special guest referee. Yes, despite being well into retirement by now, Austin was still able to make a couple of appearances in 2007, but even he couldn't put the beef towards the champ and the dead man to bed, because once it was over and Batista was standing tall, his opponent would demand one more rematch for November 18th's Survivor Series. And this time it would be held inside of the challenger's own backyard, as it would take place inside the confines of Hell in a Cell. So realizing this represented the greatest threat to his title reign, the animal would quickly get to work on preparing himself for what was to come. Before that match would take place though, the undercard would see CM Punk successfully defend his ECW world title against both The Miz and John Morrison, Randy Orton get the better of Shawn Michaels once again, and Cody Rhodes make an early pay-per-view appearance when he teamed with Hardcore Holly to challenge Lance Cade and Trevor Murdoch for the world tag team titles. Then after that, Batista would retain his title against The Undertaker, all with a little help from a returning Edge, of course. Not that Edge had any kind of allegiance with the animal, though. No, he just simply wanted to be the one to take the belt from the man himself. And this would lead us into the last pay-per-view of the year, Armageddon, on December 16th then, as there, Batista, Edge, and The Undertaker would go at it in a triple threat match for the World Heavyweight title. Of course, this match and Edge's subsequent win during it to regain his lost gold would not be the only thing people were talking about most when this show was over, because aside from it also featuring Jeff Hardy getting a surprise win over Triple H, it would also mark the return of Chris Jericho to competition for the first time in two years. Yes, after weeks of cryptic Save Us.222 messages airing on WWE TV, the whole thing would finally climax with Y2J making his re-debut on the November 19th episode of Raw, and from there immediately setting his sights on WWE Champion Randy Orton. So when the two finally went at it in the ring on this night, expectations were high that, now fully reinvigorated after his time away, Jericho would be able to become a two-time champion by the end of things. Unfortunately for him though, while he would end up winning this one, it would only be by disqualification, and so as a result, the title would not change hands. But even if he hadn't been successful in taking home the gold, he'd still made a big bang upon his return and re-established himself as a main event player to watch heading into 2008. Because another tribute to the troop show in Iraq aside, this would mark the end of the year for WWE. 
And while there are large parts of it they probably wish they could forget, at least it closed out with some excitement. As with Edge now standing tall as World Heavyweight Champion and some more big returns being imminent, 2008 was setting up to be a much better year for the company after going through such a tumultuous 12-month period.